Good morning. We are starting a fresh letter. This letter, like many of the letters in the Geras HaKadosh, discusses tzedakah. Another fundraising letter. This one written in, uh, we're assuming it's 1802, based on the evidence that the, the people know. I don't know how they figured this stuff out, but this one's written in 1802. It's a letter, it's probably one of the longer letters. It's a long letter. He starts off with a whole nother topic, which is actually a very important topic for us, because another one of these fundamental, basic ideas of Hasidus to understand. So we're not going to get to the, really the topic of Staka, besides the first line, until probably four classes from now, because uh, it's a long chapter. There's going to be five. You can break up this letter into five pieces. The first four are going to discuss the ideas, and the fifth one is going to come back and so in other words, the Alter Rebbe is writing a letter to his Hasidim and to give and support the Jews in Israel, which, by the way, I just want to take a moment to dedicate to this class uh, to in 1929, today, on the 17th, that, that year was a Friday, uh, the 17th of Av, uh, Friday on Shabbat, terrible massacre uh, in Hebron. It was literally a miniature of October 7th. What took place in Hebron, they came in, by the Arabs with the quiet hands held back behind the backs of the British, uh, you know, authority, and they butchered, murdered, raped, tortured, burned, um, just like we saw on October seventh. But thank God it was a much smaller number of people. It was a smaller community. There's between sixty-seven and sixty-nine Jews murdered, and uh, many, many abused terribly and and uh, hurt, etc. Nineteen twenty-nine. This would be before state of Israel, before, I mean, before a formal state, before everything else, no land issues, it was just hatred um, against the Jews. So today we'll dedicate the learning for those who live, those who survive, and also in memory of those who protected the Jews. There were very few, but there were some who protected Jews. Okay, so this letter is written again uh, as a request of the Alter Rebbe to send money to Israel to support the new communities that were starting to grow. Uh, back again, this is again the 1800s, early 1800s. And this letter is going to explain some basic ideas in Hasidus, very deep. It's actually a very, I think everything is deep, but I don't always know about it. You know, sometimes you learn something to realize how deep it is because we're touching the surface. Here it's clear that we're talking about some deep ideas, understanding the process and the levels and the story, the creation, the higher worlds, the lower worlds, uh, what's called Seder Shashalus, the progression of God's light coming into this world from the highest place. And as, as it comes down to the lower world, the spiritual worlds, and eventually into our physical world. So that's the topic. We're on page 212, the bottom of the page. Now, each letter that addresses Daka takes another point, another angle, another, another, it's not just repetitive letters, because the sons chose letters to put in here that would be instructive. The letter we just finished was all about how Tzedakah is an idea of redemption. Tzedakah takes a person out of the limitations, out of the layers that conceal our true identity, and in the spirit of redemption, or Geula, or Mashiach, sets us free from those things that hold us back from being the real me, the real I. And just like the world is not being the real world, it's concealed by things that cover godliness, we have that too, and Tzedakah opens up and reveals the truth. That was the last letter. Today's letter, or I should say the next letter we're going to do over many weeks, is going to discuss how Tzedakah actually draws down godliness in a way that is amazing that is that is incredible and that's what we're going to talk about here okay it starts off the verse we're going to quote is a verse that describes a very simple basic idea about king david but we're not going to go into it in a simple level we're going to jump right into the zohar i'll, I'll tell you outside what the verse is talking about chapter or letter five but yes david shame and david made a name that's all we have on this information. What does it mean David made a name? So it says there that David had a very good name amongst his people and around the world. Why? There's different opinions what it was, but there are two main themes that many commentators bring down. Either because he was very good to his enemies. What does that mean? He killed them. He was a ferocious warrior. But he allowed respectful burial of the dead. In those days, not everyone allowed it. And today, again, we see, unfortunately, enemies of the Jewish people and other enemies around the world don't respect necessarily the dead. The Jewish people, we do. So David HaMelech was really the one who started that. 
he allowed every time he won a battle, he won many battles. He was a very, very successful warrior, which is why he didn't build the base of Mikdash. God said, even though your wars were just, you spill blood, the temple is all about peace, your son Shalem will build it. But David Amalek was successful, but he allowed the burial of his death. So one thing was, he had a good name for treating with respect those who were his enemies. And the other thing is, he had a good name for the way he waged war successfully. He was somebody that waged war in a tremendously successful way and destroyed his enemies, and he had a good name or, or, or a strong name. Okay, that's the literal translation. We're not going there. We're going to Pirish Bezer HaKadosh. Zohar explains something else. David made God's name. Not Vayas, David, shame. David made his name great. No, David made God's name. And the question is going to be is, how do you make God's name? You could say, I acted the way that respected God's name. I gave God, you know, um, proper respect. What does it mean he made God's name? That's what we're going to talk about. So it says, Upirish Bezer HaKadosh, and the Zohar says, Mishanemar, it says further, David HaMelech would do Mishpat, charity, for all his people. In other words, David HaMelech, by the act of charity, made God's name. And that's going to be the entire chapter to explain that. But we're first going to go and explain something else for like five pages, and then we'll come back to this topic. But it says that David HaMelech made God's name by charity. Through the act of giving tzedakah, through the act of charity, he made God's name, whatever that means. Tzedakah? What? Tzedakah not from the word tzedakah. Sometimes it does, yes. Certain words have multiple meanings. Sometimes yeah. tzedakah means righteousness, yes. As Tamar is saying, isn't stuck for the word tzedakah. So first of all, now is a good time to throw in a pre-Rosh Hashanah message. Since from two days ago, with the customers to start from the 15th of every wish each other to be inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life. So maybe all be inscribed and sealed in the Book of Life. There are three words that the Rebbe on occasion spoke about that are all given the wrong translation from the Hebrew and have a really uh, particular meaning that people miss out on. And the three words are tefillah, teshuva, and tzedakah. Tefillah, most people translate as prayer. And it's not wrong, but it's not right. Tefillah doesn't mean prayer, it means connection. A time to pray is a time to connect. It's a time to bond and become one with God. It happens to be. That when you're connected to God, it's a great time to ask for things too. But tefillah is not about praying and asking. Tefillah is about the word tofa, like tefillin, to tie. You tie, you connect things. Davening is a time to become one with Hashem, to bond with Hashem, to come connected. That's one where the Rebbe says people translate as prayer. And it's everyone says prayer, but it really means connection. It happens to be that during connection time is a great time to pray and ask for what we need. The second word is teshuva. People use the word teshuva to say repentance. Shuva does not mean repentance, because repentance means really becoming a new person. Shuva means going back to the real you. Shuva means return. Go back. Don't become a new person. Go back to the real you. A lot of times people say, I'm going to repent. I'm going to stop being who I am. I'm becoming a new person. No. Don't become a new person. Become the old person. Remember who you really are. That's the last chapter. Uncover all the layers that are covering your true identity. So Shuva doesn't mean to become a new person. It means to become the old you, the real you. And the word tzedakah, people translate as charity, it really means justice or righteousness. To give tzedakah is not an act of charity. I'm not charitable when I give tzedakah. I'm doing the right thing. It's like the metaphor you give is, imagine a teacher has a classroom full of students, and he takes one student and says, here's all the cookies, please give them out to everybody, and the extra ones you can keep for yourself. So the person goes and gives out the cookies, and you go, wow, you're so charitable. Charitable. You are doing the right thing. You were given all the cookies to take care of everybody, and whatever's extra, you keep for yourself. So the mitzvah of tzedakah is God gives somebody a lot of money, take care of those around you who need it, and then keep the rest for yourself and make yourself a nice home and a car. But when you give tzedakah to others, that's not a charitable thing. That's doing justice the right thing. So to answer Tamar's question, you're right. Tzedakah comes from the same word as tzedek. So tzedek and your righteousness, being just. But also, in this case, we, tra- we use that translation of charity, giving tzedakah. So we use that word, but again, so it is ultimately ch- uh, being just. But it's, it means here you're giving charity. Okay. Now you have the style of the Zohar. A lot of times is certain words that seem interesting. A lot of times you find it says Pasach, the Amar. He opened and he spoke because uh, Pasach means to open a new channel to begin a new revelation. Sometimes you find Bach, he cried. Crying is an act of expressing something from deep within ourselves. When a person cries, I'm not talking about a child who wants a, you know, another lollipop. 
We're talking about when a person cries because something hurts or something's painful or something's um, truly, truly touching. That means something deep within you is coming out. When it says in the Zohar that some author, some of the rabbis, they of Amar, they cried and they said, they weren't crying because necessarily they were sad. They were crying because it was a very deep, deep feeling they expressed. So it says here, Bachar Rabbi Shimon Amar. Rabbi Shimon cried and he said, Man Ovid Shema Kadisha Bekal Yema. How or wh- who does make God's name every day? Man de Yohiv Staka Le Miskane Chulu. Whoever gives charity to the poor. You want to know how to make God's name? Give charity to the poor, you're making God's name. That's what Rabbi Shimon says. Now, that is the opening statement of chapter 5, and now we're going to go into explanations. We're going to start off, the first topic we're going to explain in this chapter, which is going to be quite a while, understanding what is Gan Eden, what is the Garden of Eden, what is Olam Abba, what are, what are these concepts, you talk about it. So the first thing to understand is, when we talk about places, there's two types of places. One place is a physical place. And, for example, this cup stands here on the table, takes up a physical spot. It's here and it's not there. That's all things that are physical. The definition of something physical is, is that it has what's called vav ktsavis, six sides. Every single thing in the world that's physical has a shape to it. A top, bottom, a right, a left, a front, and a back. Now, um, some are very narrow, some are tiny, some are very hard to measure, but they're all there. Spiritual things don't have physical dimensions. So the truth is, when you get to radio waves, Bluetooth, these are all entering the realm of closest spirituality. That's why you have, they're very great metaphors to understand spirituality, because air, wind, a gravity, the less we could measure it, see, wind, you can measure. Radio waves, you can, the less you can measure it, the more spiritual it is. So all those things can be measured too, but not the same as you can measure like a, you know, a book or measure a table. So it's already moving on to the world of spirituality. The definition of something physical is that it has a measurable space. It has space that it takes up. That's one type of space. Then you have a place is like, sometimes you look at somebody and you notice that for the last five minutes, that little smile on their face or a sad look on their face, they were not here. They were somewhere else. And then suddenly they realize and they come back to, where were you? It was, I was somewhere else. Well, I saw your body. Well, somewhere else doesn't always mean a place. It means it's like, for an example, where did that idea come from? Hmm. Well, it was slowly came from the corner and moved across the room. No, it's, it's a place. It's a concept. There's, there's, um, there's sources deep within our soul. There's, there's um, spiritual ideas that don't have a physical space. So are they everywhere or nowhere? We don't use space to measure them. It's like, how much space does two times two take up? Well, if you say it with a loud voice, it could be like this big, you know. <laughs> so there's no space. These are things that don't have space. Things that are spiritual don't have a space. When we talk about the Garden of Eden, we're not talking about a physical place. It's a place. It's a reality. It's a truth. It actually exists in a more real sense than this exists in the room in front of us. But it's extremely not, it's not, extremely, it's not associated with physical space. So it's not like if you go up to Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, Where's the Garden of Eden? It's everywhere. It's nowhere. It's here. It's, it's another reality. It's another dimension. It's a dimension that doesn't require physical. It's like our souls. We say there's a soul in this room now. All the souls are here. Souls are, souls, souls are moving around the universe all the time. You don't see them because you don't feel them. Well, sometimes you could feel a certain sense of a neshama. It's really interesting. But it's not a physical place. Those souls live in a reality that's not a different place than we are now. But at the same time, it's not a physical, measurable place. It's, it's, a, it's a reality. It's a truth. That world of Gan Eden is that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about... Now, there are places where it discusses Gan Eden as a place. There's a whole commentary you can look into where you find that they found the entrance that when Avram Avinu was looking for a place and Sarah, he went and he found the entrance to Gan Eden. What that means, is that a portal? Is that an idea? I don't know. I don't know enough about it to explain it, but it's not a physical place. Okay. That being said, we're going to understand what is the Garden of Eden, what is Gan Eden, and we're going to get a whole new appreciation, but it's going to take, there's, there's actually a beautiful video, and I, I, would, I would share it if I found it later today, uh, I'll share it on the group. It's this person explaining a conversation, it's a two-minute video, he had a conversation with the Rebbe, and he was trying to understand what will it be like when Mashiach comes, what type of good, how good could it be, how good? 
And the Rebbe explained to him, our minds are not able to comprehend such a concept of good. We we live in a dimension, like, we can't imagine things that don't exist in the world. Like, if someone say, tell me a different form of travel. We could only use examples of things that we know of, okay, it's going to be teleported, it's going to... There's, tell me a different form of energy, a different form of, you know, that because we only live, it's like trying to explain to a blind person the difference between blue and red and green. They can't understand that because they don't have that whole world of knowledge of colors. So you can't start telling them, well, blues are like a much more, like it's closer to purple or it's like a heavy color, dark color. <laughs> That's not what you're talking about. Why? They don't live in that world of color. We don't live in that world of good. So to us, we can't explain, but the Rebbe was telling him, it's a level of good that you can't, it's so great, you can't comprehend it today. It's a, it's a short video, but it's, it's a very beautiful video. We have to try and imagine now today sitting here, what can Gan Eden be that's so amazing and so cool and so special to have our conversation here? So we're going to understand that there's something called a difference between what's called Hasaga. Hasaga means to understand. You can have, for an example, a person come into this room and give a class, I don't know what an example would be, quantum physics or whatever the class would be, which is professor level that understand, and he could talk for an hour, brilliant ideas, and we'll be like, wow, that guy has a deep voice, you know? <laughs> I, uh, it's like, it's like uh, it's someone who's going to read a book in Japanese about a topic. You will never understand what the topic's about because we don't live with it. But how about if suddenly you could understand what he's talking about? you'll go, wow, that was incredible. That was mind-blowing. For an example, take a person who never in their life experienced music. Because, not because they're deaf. They just never heard music before. They only heard words. Or someone who never in their life experienced food. They they lived their entire life on IV. And you start telling them, amazing. You could take meat from an animal. You could chew it in your mouth till it gets all mushy and swallow it and has so much flavor. And that guy's like, why would I want to do that? That's like... And for some people, one of the greatest pleasures in the world is a good piece of food, a good piece of cake, a good cup of coffee, the music. You tell the guy, you're going to take some strings and you're going to scratch a stick along it. And if you do it <laughs> in the right speed, it's going to it's going to move your heart. Uh, OK, thank you. Next. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, one of the things that we have trouble with is understanding how was it that in the times of the first temple and earlier, people worshiped idols. People went to a rock. People went to a tree. People went to the sun. And prayed, and to the point, as we know in Balpar, they actually lost control of their physical bodies. They actually, they 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 they, they released themselves. They went to the, the bathroom it, it, from emotion. They couldn't control their bodies. What's wrong with you guys? Are you weirdos? What we don't understand is, at those times before the end of the first temple, Hashem experience that we don't have a reference today of how powerful. Think of something the most moving experience with someone you love, or the most moving experience with the music. Or with a powerful, um, uh, I don't know what would be a good case. I don't want to use examples of anything intoxicating or drugs, but things that could completely put you in a mood on a high that you can't even imagine. That is nothing compared to the experience of somebody who prayed to an idol. Their bodies would 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 be so alive and so energized and so real. Their skin would be flushed. It was an experience that was palatable and, and tangible and real. We don't know what that is, so we looked at them as fools. Okay, we don't understand. It's like a deaf person, God forbid, watching somebody dance to music. He's like, I don't understand. He goes, you don't hear that music? I don't, why? Because it's a, something we can't re- understand or enjoy or appreciate. That's how we see godliness in this world today. I was listening to a class by Rabbi Yael Khan, and he explains it like this. He says, let's say, for example, you want to teach somebody a new idea, but it's an idea that's out of their ability to understand. So use a metaphor. The person who walks away with a metaphor without really understanding the idea, he thinks the metaphor is the idea. Oh, so it's like the I heard Rabbi Stein, I read Rabbi Steinhaus' book years ago, where he describes a map. He said you have a map, and on the map, you know, for state highways they're red, and city highways are green, and uh, interstates are let's say blue. And he says, don't think when you go there, there's going to be blue and red and green roads. It's just we're using them as metaphors, so you know what do you mean? You're not. So why are you making them blue? We we have to live in that. So. When you look at the map, don't convince yourself that that's what the picture of the, you know, if there's a railroad tracks or there's a river and it has a symbol of some squiggles. Where are the squiggles they had on the map? It's don't get lost in the metaphor. What happens is in this world, we're lost in the metaphor. Godliness is everywhere. A child being born, a flower blooming, a table existing, a cup, you know, water 
flowing and rocks not, not flowing. We take it for granted that the sun rises and the sea doesn't split. All these things are godliness expressed. These are metaphors. We don't see it. In Gan Eden, we're going to see it, which means, wow, suddenly we hear the music. Suddenly we feel that we have the flavors, we have the tastes. That's Gan Eden. Gan Eden is a chance for the soul to experience. And this experience, and this is the key, is all dependent on what we do. So what type of Gan Eden will I have? Depends. I put on fill in seven times. I'll have seven energies of tefillin and infuse my Ganeidin. I gave charity a hundred times. I made a bracha a thousand times. You know, I, I said the Shema two thousand times. All these things are creating the reality, the energy, the effort, the experience. It's like how much food do you get to have on Shabbos? It all depends how much you cook. If you come into your house a Friday afternoon and you sit down and relax and you don't do anything, you come into the Shabbos table, where's the food? You're supposed to cook the food. You have to do something. It doesn't happen by itself, you know. If you go to someone else's house, that's different. In your home, you got to make it. Ganeiden is like Shabbos. Misha Tarach of Shabbos, someone who cooks Arab Shabbos, has a delicious meal. Someone who doesn't, this is boring, you know? So they say how much, as we'll see in the chapter, is your Ganeiden? It all depends how much you prepared for it. So in this chapter, we're going to begin chapter, section one, talking about Ganeiden. So let's see it inside. The Yuvon Behekte Maimed Azal We'll understand this based on a teaching of our sages. Ayin Pei means al pasuk. It says ki be, the word is be yud hey, but because I don't want to say God's name, I'm going to read ki beka. Uh, Hashem tzur elamim. With yud k, God's name is made up of four letters usually. Yud, and then hey, vav, and then hey, which as we spoke earlier, I'll remind us in a moment, represents or uh, also has definition in all the spheros, all the worlds, if you remember that we said Yud is Atsilus, He is Berea, uh, Vav is Yetzira, and the second He is Asiya, the four worlds. Um, also Yud is Chachma, He is Bina, uh, Vav represents the six Midas, the six emotions, and the second He is Malchus. These are concepts we spoke about, and we'll, we'll go back into it. Those two things overlap. That means if Yud is both Chachma and Atsilus, that means Atsilus, like they say, if A equal B and B equal C, then A equal C. So if Yud is both, uh, if Yud Hashem's name is both Chachma and Atsilus, that means Yud or Chachma is also Atsilus. Because the world of Atsilus actually is the emanation of the Yud of God's name, the Chachma of reality. Then you have Bina of reality. So each of the four worlds represent one of those four themes within the structure of our soul, which is Chachma is Atsilus, Bina is Berea, the six emotions are going to be Yetzirah, and the second He, which is Malchus, the final expression, as we'll talk about, is Asi. Again, these are Kabbalistic terms. So this idea is that Kibiya, or Kibika, with the Yud and the He, were created the worlds. Which worlds? Now, the word Sur usually means rock. It also can mean to fashion, like Yetzir of the forming God, God made with his hands. So the same word for rock also can mean to create. So be kibika Hashem with the yud and hey, Hashem created the worlds. That means the physical world is made, the world we live in today. You can knock on wood. Hey, knock on wood. It's not even real wood. It's, it's knock on table. Uh is made with the letter A. The the spiritual worlds, that means the worlds of Ganadin, etc., is made with the letter Yud. So we're going to see the worlds were created with the Yud and the Hey of God's name. Pirush, what does this mean? That means if we say the letter He or the letter Yud, that means that's the concept, that's the idea. So Yud, you remember, is Chachma. What's Chachma? That first initial um, dot of inspiration, a flash. We know we, we have ideas. Where do they come from? So we have something we experience by learning, reading, hearing, discovering, and we generate and digest and analyze and use those as springboards for more information. So if you learn that fire is hot, you go, hey, I can cook food with it. You know, you start learning information. If I learn about algebra or science or physics, I could build, I could do things. The same thing with philosophy. Then you have things that don't come from your knowledge. They come from deep within your soul. I got an idea popped into my head. Where did that come from? I think the end of my elbow? No, where did it come from? Again, it's not a place. Deep within my soul, idea popped into my head. A solution to a problem I was trying to have. A new innovative idea. And those ideas, by the way, as you spoke, if you remember, going back to the very beginning of Tanya, 
are like a flash of lightning inside of a pitch black building that you got lost in the woods. You have to try and tap into it right away. So you have a flash of lightning and you have to go, okay, I saw a staircase to the right. I saw you know, a sink to the left. I saw a couch in front of me, a door. You have to try and imagine and develop what you just saw. A person who starts talking to you right after you get that flash, and they say, shh, shh, shh. I'm, I, what, I, I just got an idea. I don't want to lose it. What do you mean lose it? That's like the creation of a child. You have an opportunity of that seed to develop into something or to get wasted or get lost. It's a very small window. That idea is Chachma. It comes from deep within our soul. And that is something which is the source of all knowledge and intelligence and information. That really is what everything comes through Chachma. Bina is, that's why we use the metaphor for the, the masculine and the feminine. Bina is the expansion. That's why men are Chachma, women are Bina. Bina is the expansion, taking that idea, developing it. It's a dot, the letter He has a top, a right, you know, it's expanded. I give it the skeleton, the meat, the bones, the, the, the structure. You have an idea. I develop it. So Bina is already a world of developing ideas and developing it to the next level. So like this. Next slide. Sorry. That pleasure that the souls of Tzadikim have, and by the way, just as a side note, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but definitely it's worth mentioning. There's a very famous letter that the Baal Shem Tov wrote to his brother-in-law on the, after Rosh Hashanah, where he tells him, I had this past Rosh Hashanah, an experience where I went to heaven and I traveled around. Again, he didn't go to the, the address. He went to heaven. That means he transported his reality into a different reality. And I'm in heaven and I'm going around to all the souls and all the people. And that's when he famously says, I met the soul of Mashiach. And I said to him, when are you coming? And he said, when you well, when you well springs spread out, etc." But that's the thing we talk about. The letter, if you read it, and I, you can have it. It's, it's, I don't know, we, over here in my house, I have the letter. Um, he writes, I was so surprised when I was going to visit all these sites of the great Sadikim who were basking in the, you know, whatever the, takes place in Gan Eden, I came across many people who I know lived life of sinners. And I realized that I'd already been through the process of cleansing in Gehenim, and now they came to Gan Eden which means he was telling us something fascinating. All the people that we, in our minds, since we're such smart judges of people's character, we look at people and we see this guy's a thief, and this guy was a this, and this guy was a that, and all those guys are going to Gan Eden too, except they have a little stop they got to make on the way to cleanse up some of the, the dirt. But everyone makes a Gan Eden, because everyone, everyone starts as a tzaddik, ends up as a tzaddik, and in the middle of tzaddikim too, the Torah says we're all tzaddikim, but we all have that spark. The fact that we get a little dirty, that doesn't change our reality. The fact that you put, you know, they say dust or dirt on top of a diamond doesn't make it less of a diamond. You've got to clean it off. So it's just interesting. It says here where the tzaddikim are going to be, uh, as we'll see in a moment, it's not as simple. And I'll explain why in one moment. But everyone gets there eventually. They get to enjoy. This is the key word you want to know. Hana. Hana is the same as hasaga. Hasaga means to understand. Hana means to enjoy. In order to understand, uh, enjoy something, you have to understand it. If I don't appreciate sushi, I will completely not enjoy it. Someone says, I got some good news for you. We don't need a kitchen anymore. We're making fish raw. You just eat it on top of some rice. It's like, this. some people find that to be one of the delicacies of the world. Some people find it to be, it doesn't attract me. Any appreciation, any joy, a guy who never had something doesn't know. You can't know. There's a very famous story which gives a lot of, it's a, not a story, it's a, meta, it's, a, it's a metaphor, but it's an idea where this, this um, poor man always tells his wife, it's not fair, I would look, all the rich people in the shtetl, they have delicious foods, there's one food I always see them eating that I want, cheese blintzes, cheese blintzes. His wife says, you can't afford cheese blintzes, because I know, anyway, one day she says, okay, I'll make it for you. And she gets a list of all the ingredients, white flour, sugar, eggs, this, Everything she mentions, he says, we don't have it, but I'll get you something else instead. Wouldn't have white flour, we'll get those days, the whole wheat was actually cheaper. Today's more expensive. Um, I wouldn't have this, wouldn't have sugar, we'll skip the sugar. Wouldn't have cheese, we'll put in vegetables. Wouldn't have this, everything he skips. She makes them this delicious cheese buns, he eats it. He spits it out, he goes, you know what I realize? Rich people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the cheese buns you're having is not the cheese buns they're having. A lot of times our impression of something is, a person never experienced food, like we said before. He doesn't understand how chewing your food and eating it and swallowing it could be so enjoyable. It sounds so bothersome, foolish, unpleasant, unappetizing, because you never experienced it before. In order to appreciate something, it has to gain an understanding of it. 
It means experience it. Taste the flavors, experience it. God says, or, or he says until him, Ta'amur uketev Hashem. Taste and you will see that God is good. A lot of times we think, I, I, I tried Judaism as a kid, I didn't like it. You tried a, a, a cheese blends made without the ingredients. If you try Judaism, you'll find it's meaningful and it lifts you up and it brings you wholeness and completeness. That's not why you should do it. But it, that's the side effect of Judaism. It makes you complete and whole and, and happier. That's the reality. So that's not the reason again, but that's what does it. To appreciate Gan Eden, we have to understand first to understand it. What happens in the Garden of Eden, the first thing is, God gives us an understanding of his light. What we can't see in this world, that's the first thing that happens there is what's called Bina. Oh, wow. Wow. Now I see those guys that were doing with the strings. It's actually beautiful music. And that steak or that, 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 that knish that, or that cheese, the cheese ones, that's actually awesome. Why? I got to appreciate and understand this. What happens is, all the there's a beautiful statement to the Baal Shemta when after he passed away, that he came to, I forget who he came to, the, the Alter Rebbe or the Magid, I think the Magid. And the Baal Shemta was very famous for having a tremendous love for children and simple people and people that were overlooked. He had a tremendous appreciation and love for them. And they used to say, if only we would have the love of the Baal Shem Tov, how we used to kiss the children when he picked them up and brought up the cheder. He loved them like a person loves their own child or grandchild. Or, it was like his love. The Baal Shem Tov, when he passed away, he told, I think, the Magid, came back to him and he said, I never knew how special it was to love your fellow Jew. He is the, he is the guy that loved his fellow Jew like no one's business. He didn't appreciate it. When you come to heaven, you finally find out what it's all about. I never realized how valuable lighting a Shabbos candle was, acting, you know, kindness, respecting somebody. These are the things we discover later. In, in the Garden of Eden, you know what that is? We find out how enjoyable. Why? Because God's revealed. We're living in the world where the truth is revealed. There's no more concealment. They, 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 they stop serving you those unflavored, you know, um, soups, and they put all the flavor in. Who shemes angim? Uh, back. But in the of Shina, we enjoy the the um, light of God's presence. The ray ziv literally means the shine of the Shechina. Hameir beganeden elyon v'tachten that shines in ganeden elyon and ganeden in ganeden itself. There's two levels. There's the higher level and the lower level. Like everything that has to be that way. Who shemes angim b'hasagosam v'haskalosam. That means they understand. My mind suddenly goes wow. I understand the lecture he's giving. Suddenly I understand, you know, you listen to a lecture in Russian, if you don't speak Russian, it's really boring. Suddenly you understand Russian, that's fascinating. You suddenly have taste buds, you suddenly have a mind to grasp, you suddenly have the no longer blockage. The first experience of Gan Eden is we start to understand, start to appreciate, start to have an enjoyment of all the things that we were told all our life. Shemaskilim, that we comprehend with intelligence. The Yedim, we know Yedim is not just to know, but to connect with. Like we said that the word Yoda means to connect with somebody. That's the way we want to talk that Abraham, that the Adam and Eve had a child that says Vayeda, he knew her, means he knew her intimately. The difference between Das and Seichel is knowing something is like I understand the, the a court case going on. Das is the court case about my child. Suddenly every detail matters to me because not just information, it's information that matters. That the Yedim, not just we understand it, but we, it's relatable. Umasigim Eza Hasaga, we understand ideas. It's the flow of godliness that we suddenly can experience. We are living in a world, we don't know godliness. That's why you can't blame us. There's a famous thing where one of the rabbis said to God, I think it was the Badichever, I'm not sure it was. He said, it's not fair. You put all the temptations in the world in front of us, and you put all the glory and the enjoyment of God in the book. You want people not to sin? Put all the temptations of the world in a book. And put the enjoyment of God in front of us, and trust we're all going to do mitzvahs. Right? That's you know, finally to understand. Um, it's finally we come to the top of the next page. We come to a place that we can actually comprehend and enjoy it. I suddenly found I can hear the music, I can taste the food, I can appreciate the conversation. I understand the logic, or even a joke. Someone says a joke in a different language. You don't find it so funny. Really, will you really laugh? Suddenly the joke's in English and has such a good, wow, that is so funny. What happened? You change the language and suddenly it touches you? Yes, because I understand. You understand. That's the first step of enjoyment and appreciation. Every single person according to his madriga and according to his myself. 
We're going to finish with this topic here. Um, but I want to take one point because this Shabbos, I'm going to speak out for a few minutes yet. Because the Shabbos is the yard site of the Rebbe's father. And I saw a letter where the Rebbe says to talk about for bringing it to Shabbos about his father's teachings, etc. I'm going to share one teaching of the Rebbe's father that he says on this Tanya right here. He says, what does it mean each person according to his madriga and according to his myself? The Alter Rebbe doesn't, as he said many times, just use synonyms or words to make it sound good. You know, he's happy and he's joyful. What does it mean? His madriga, his level, and his actions. Madriga re refers to the intellectual and emotional journey of a Jew. Every Jew has two ways that we operate. The physical interactions, I put on tefillin, I light a Shabbos candle, I uh, kiss the mezuzah, I ate the matzah on Pesach, whatever it is. All those things are physical actions. That's my stuff, my actions. Then you have Madrega. Madrega levels could be my intellectual and emotional involvement. Was I understanding what I was doing? Was I really needs it's like what we call Ahava and Yira, the love and fear. But love and fear in Judaism doesn't come by itself, comes preceded by intellect. See, love and fear that comes naturally are usually to material experience. I like the way it tasted. It was so much fun. It looked so cool. It was so nice. It was so amazing. These are all natural responses that come from our natural soul. But when you have a, a emotion, whether it's a fear or love that's preceded by intellect, it means I think deeply into this other fellow Jew, their story, their pain, their, their hardships, their life. Suddenly I develop a love for them. That love didn't come naturally. That love came, some people are naturally very nice people, but that true love came because I took the time to understand them. I took the time to appreciate the value of a mitzvah, the value of you know giving charity to a poor person. I, I took it and I experienced it fully. That's Madrega. Now, why are these things so important? I will finish with this. Very, very interesting and important concept about Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden does not exist in a space of experience until you create it, which means every one of us have to create a godly experience creates our reality of the future, which means if I'm going to, like I said before, if I'm going to light Shabbos candles a thousand times in my lifetime, when I get to heaven, I will have a place filled up with the light and the results and the benefit of a thousand Shabbos candles. Add to that a thousand times having guests and a thousand times giving charity and a thousand times making a blessing. Think about the tremendous world of good you created, but it's only what you invest, like Shabbos. You cook for Shabbos, you have what to eat. You don't cook, nothing's there. So the reality of our Gan Eden is going to be based on our in, in emotional, intellectual, and practical involvement in Judaism and Godliness in this world where we can't see it. We don't realize that we planted a seed and made an investment, we did a thing, and it's creating so much reality for our Gan Eden. This brings us to a very fascinating question. One of the interesting and important characters in Jewish history was a man named Elazar ben Dudai. Elazar ben Dudai is quoted in Tanya. We had him in, in the, in the Gers of Shiva. He was a man that was called the professional sinner. He sinned, but like a bubby. He knew how to sin. He sinned with every possible woman that he could find. He did sins all the time in the most interesting ways, and he was a sinner. At the He lived his entire life that way. At the very end of his life, one of the people he was sinning with made a comment to him that touched his heart. He realized, what am I doing? He cried out to God in a tremendous, painful cry, and his soul left his body. And his, it says he died a righteous man. Thousands of righteous but he has a problem. He died at Sadiq, but he has no God eaten. What's he going to do? He come up there, empty table. Also like this, there at nothing. I mean, he never created anything. So what's the benefit of dying at Sadiq if he has nowhere to, I mean, very nice, you died at Sadiq. So what's your afterlife going to be like? It's very quiet. You, get, you know, maybe I'll give you a pair of mittens from Bernie Sanders. I mean, what are you going to have? Why don't I just read it? I don't know. Okay. So the bottom line is, I was just thinking of that poor look. So the, the, the bottom line is, what did he have? So the Gemara says that he was actually, the Kabbalah says he was a reincarnation of Yechonen Kohen Gadol. Yechonen Kohen Gadol was a man until 80 years old, lived as an absolute righteous tzaddik. At the age of 80, because of his son and because of various things, he turned and became a uh, tzaduki, tzadusi, went against God, became a sinner, and died an unrighteous person, died a sinner. So it says that his soul came back to this world. He had a problem. I filled up an account for 80 years. You never get, lose it, by the way. But it, it's not like I did it since I lose it. It's there. The account is packed. But he died a sinner, so he's not going anywhere. He has, he has blockage. You know, his car broke down just before the uh, crossed the border. So it says his soul came down and had to live the opposite life. A man whose whole life sinned. And the last day of his life, he did tshuva. And that composite came up and had a beautiful Gan Eden. 
who was a soul that had both uh, both things there. This is the story of our lives. A lot of times we realize, you might say one second, I missed 20 years, I missed 30 years, I missed 40 years. It was probably someone lived before you that had those 20 years, didn't have these years. So at the end of the day, it's a phenomenal thing. We're actually completing all of us. It says all souls today are completing the journey of a previous soul. So we're all here. So there's a mitzvah that's hard to do. It's probably important. If you might say one second, what did I benefit if I didn't do it for 20 years? Someone else did it for 20 years for you. You just take over from here. So it's almost like a relay race. But the bottom line is that this is the story of our souls. And Hashem should bless us that we should be what's called Elam Chatir Bechayacha. Not to have to wait till we make it up there. But it says righteous people, Hashem shows them down in this world already to experience the blessings of what you're finding on Aden, but to have it already here. May we merit very soon the coming of Mashiach, and we'll continue with this chapter next week, God willing. Friend, um...